Welcome everybody to today's webinar, Creating More Than Housing. Today's webinar is brought to you by Open Architecture Collaborative, the AIA Housing Knowledge Communities, and EDI International. Our first present presenter is Anne Marie Lubino. She is the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence at the Bruner Foundation. This award celebrates practices distinguished by design and their contributions to the social and economic vitality of American cities. An architect, educator, and nonprofit leader, Anne Marie focuses on engaging people in the design of the built environment. She previously served as the CEO of the Community Center of Pittsburgh and was a 2012 Loeb Fellow at Harvard University. Our second presenter is Garner Miller. He has been practicing architecture in Washington State for over 20 years with expertise in the design of educational, commercial, and civic facilities. Garner has won several local and regional AIA design awards. He is managing partner of MSGS Architects, a regional firm based in Olympia. Garner is interested in urban issues and historic preservation and serves on the board of directors of Olympia Downtown Association and the City of Olympia's Heritage Commission. And my name is Tommy Burns, and I'll be the moderator of today's presentation. If you have any questions, you can submit them in the chat box. It should be on your screen. Um, technical questions will be answered as soon as possible, and content-related questions will be answered during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please take a moment to look over the copyright and compliance statement. So today's presentation, we're talking about housing. Housing can do more than provide places for people to live. It can address challenging urban issues like education, chronic homelessness, and the regeneration of blighted, disconnected communities. Housing can, be, housing can connect people to resources and improve quality of life for residents as well as for those in the surrounding community. It can change perceptions, broker new ideas and relationships, and be a catalyst for dialogue and investment. This session will examine the planning and development of three projects that received the 2015 Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence. Miller's Court in Baltimore, Quijote Village in Olympia, and Uptown District in Cleveland. Our presentation um, will have case studies that will utilize detailed studies developed by the Bruner Foundation that document and the development and impact of the projects in their communities. And the following learning objectives will be covered through this presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Anne Marie. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us for this webinar. Uh, as Tommy mentioned, my name is Anne Marie Lubino, and I'm the director of the Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence, which is a program of the Bruner Foundation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And oh, there we go. And. Uh, uh, today we'll be uh, talking about, we'll be presenting uh, three of our award winners from 2015, the 2015 Rudy Bruner Award for Urban Excellence. Um, I'll be joined by Garner Miller, the architect of Quixote Village, one of our three award winners, and he will uh, present that project. I'll also provide a, a, brief inter a brief overview of the Rudy Bruner Award and how it works, um, then talk about Miller's Court and Uptown District, and then Garner will wrap up with Quixote Village. Um, I wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about the um, the issue of housing. I think, as we're all aware, uh, housing is, is probably always has been and continues to be a critical issue in our 
cities, um, particularly now, um, I think there's increased concern about growing costs of housing, particularly for renters, who are often folks that are um, sometimes most at risk. And the three award winners that we'll be talking about today are um, three different types of rental housing that address um, specific populations in, in three different cities in the United States. Um, Miller's Court in Baltimore, which um, provides su um, supportive living and working environment for school teachers and educators related nonprofits. Um, Uptown District in Cleveland, Ohio, which is a, a collaborative redevelopment of a mixed use corridor linking arts, education, healthcare institutions, and adjoining communities. And Quixote Village, a, a low cost, sustainable community of houses developed for and in part by people who were homeless. Um, the Rudy Brunner Award was, uh, is a national design award that was created in 1987 um, to really promote uh, innovative thinking about urban development and um, was created at a time when there are a lot of challenges facing um, American cities. And it was founded by Simeon Brunner, an architect, as a way of bringing attention to the um, uh, potential of architect to architecture to address not only physical design of places, but also social, economic, and environmental issues. Um, our goals include um, discovering and celebrating transformative urban places, really helping people to understand the complexity of making great urban places, and sharing the stories of our award winners um, with people so that they can learn from those experiences. Um, over nearly three decades of the award, we have um, close to 80 award winners across the U.S., as you can see on this map, um, pretty broad diversity um, of places. Our projects, um, run our, our include a range, our winners include a range of projects of all different scales and types of projects, including public markets, housing, uh, large-scale infrastructural, cultural facilities, uh, uh, public parks, uh, education facilities. A number of our winners address housing for the homeless, and an increasing number of our winners, including public markets and a restaurant, uh, address the issue of food systems, which have become, a, I think, a growing area of interest for a number of uh, architects and urban planners and designers. Uh, more than 50% of our winners uh, involve housing in, in one shape or form. Sometimes the projects aren't all about housing. Um, often, more often than not, um, the project is it, it's about creating more than housing, uh, but creating places that help to um, help to build better communities and build the capacity of, of individuals and organizations. Throughout our, uh, all of our award winners, we've, we've realized that there are a number of common themes that we'll hear a little bit, bit about today in the three stories we share with you. The role of vision and leadership um, coming from all different places and all different forms, sometimes grassroots, sometimes top down. Uh, the importance of engagement and capacity building that these projects, again, are doing more than just building physical places, but are helping to um, help helping people to get involved in the development of these places, collaborative partnerships, and uh, anchoring projects and places that um, really make them unique to their place, and of course, leveraging the power of design. I'm going to very quickly talk about how the Rudy Brunner Award works. Uh, every two years, the award is biennial. We uh, recognize five projects, one gold medal winner, which receives a $50,000 cash award, and four silver medals that each receive $10,000. The uh, process begins with a call for entries. In fact, this September, we'll be issuing our call for entries for the 2017 award. Uh, our application itself is pretty intensive. Uh, in addition to the ones, uh, the components one might usually expect in an award application, such as a description of the project and photographs, we ask for pretty detailed descriptions of the projects and a minimum of four perspective sheets. And these are really intended to um, really get sort of behind development of the project and understand how it was designed and how it works. And we seek perspectives from architects and designers, um, such as the architect from Miller's Court that you'll hear a little bit more about shortly, as well as community perspectives and um, perspectives of, um, from folks like developers or consultants in the projects, even public officials. Each, with each cycle, we put together a new selection committee composed of six people. We always have a mayor on our committee. Um, as well as other urban experts, often architects, landscape architects, urban planners, people involved in financing projects and community development um, that bring a variety of perspectives and knowledge to the table. We also always involve a past award winner in our most recent cycle in 2015, Larry Kearns from Wheeler Kearns Architects in 
Chicago, who's the architect for uh, Inspiration Kitchens, our, our 2013 gold medalist, was on our committee. The committee meets twice, uh, the first time to review all the applications, we covered about 100. They then pick five finalists, and then they'll meet again to review um, findings from the site visits. Uh, in between the two meetings, a team from the Bruner Foundation goes out and spends two to three days on each site, walking the site, taking photographs, and meeting with people involved in the development, design, operation, and, um, and people uh, affected um, in the communities by the project. And we gather all that information and share it with the selection committee. Uh, after the selection committee determines the medalist, we um, put together a ceremony with um, each project and work hard to include a public program because we really like to share the stories of these projects and really help people understand the complexity of urban placemaking. And when we are all finished, we put together a detailed case study about each project um, so you can go online and uh, read about each of our award winners and understand, uh, learn about how they came to be, um, the design of the project, uh, the operation of the project, and also its impact. Um, all of these are available on our website. We also have a relationship with the University of Buffalo, uh, which keeps a digital archive of our winners, um, and you can actually go in and look at all the applications. So just quickly, our 2015 winners, as I mentioned, will be giving you a, a tour of three of them today. I also wanted to highlight our two other 2015 award winners, Silver Medalist Falls Park on the Reedy in Greenville, South Carolina, which is the renaissance of a a river quarter running through the heart of the city, um, and which resulted in the creation of a, a wonderful urban park. It's really become kind of the signature element of downtown Greenville and the Grand Rapids downtown market in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, which is a new public market and community gather, gathering space that supports uh, local food and entrepreneurism in downtown Grand Rapids, Michigan. So um, I will um, go over two of the projects, Miller's Court, which is our gold medal winner from Baltimore, Maryland, uh, that involves 40 units of housing for school teachers um, and was designed by Marks Thomas Architects in Baltimore. Uh, the project goals um, really focused on creating high quality affordable housing for teachers, also creating a high quality working space for education related nonprofits, and also to really help um, improve the, the neighborhood in which it's located and to help um, also um, improve and contribute to the revitalization of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, for those of you familiar with the city um, on the map, um, the project is located about two miles north of downtown Baltimore in the Inner Harbor. Uh, it's located in a neighborhood called um, Remington, or it's referred to as being located in Remington. It's actually at the juncture. If you look at this map, it's in the, in the exact center of this map. It's located at the juncture of Remington, Charles Village, and Old Goucher. Um, these are primarily uh, traditionally working class neighborhoods, that um, housing that was built from the 1800s into the early 1900s that supported industry uh, along the Jones River Valley, which is where I-83 runs through now. Um, it's also located close to Johns Hopkins Homewood Campus and the Maryland um, Institute College of Art, uh, which are partners in this project. Um, and this photograph gives you a sense in many ways is kind of a classic Baltimore residential neighborhood of modest brick row homes of ranging from two to three stories and some occasional warehouses. Uh, the project was developed by Seawold Development Company, a mission-based development company founded by Donald and Thibault Mannequin. Uh, Donald's in the center, Thibault's to the right. They are a father-son team. Uh, Donald worked for decades in the family real estate business. Um, Thibault um, uh, sort of became interested in real estate development after working abroad in several nonprofit initiatives. And to the left is John Constable, one of their partners. Uh, Donald and Thibault came, um, uh, came to the table with an idea of finding a way to give back to Baltimore, a city that, where they both um, lived and loved and decided to focus on finding a way to help the quality, to support the quality of public education in the schools of Baltimore. And they decided that by doing that, they would provide high quality, affordable housing for teachers. And they set out to do that by finding a way to reinvest in one of Baltimore's neighborhoods and um, found this uh, formerly vacant warehouse structure uh, that was occupied by the American Can Factory. 
and um, that became the focus of the the project. Um, as you can see from the site plan, it is a U-shaped structure that wraps around the central courtyard. It has two components, a commercial component, a several story building that houses the nonprofit uh, office space as well as a, a community cafe and then the L-shaped blue residential structure that wraps around it. They, uh, and here's a view from the outside and a view of the courtyard. Uh, part of there, they, they worked very carefully. The, um, they and their architecture team held a number of meetings with both the neighborhood and future tenants to uh, establish some goals for the project and to inform the design of the project. Um, and here you can get, a, again, a, a feel for this is the, the ground floor of how the, the different components of the building fit together. Um, one of the, there are two really um, important components or outcomes of those meetings. So the first was with the teachers. They were seeking a way to create a community within the building. Um, the teachers, uh, one of the, the outcomes of that discussion was the idea of creating a teacher resource center where teachers could have access to copiers to put together um, lessons plans at the last moment. And the other thing was the idea is that if these were to be affordable, it meant that a lot of teachers would be sharing an apartment. So that led them to create a one-to-one -one ratio between bedrooms and baths in all of the, the apartments in the building. And here you can get a sense of the um, kind of the contemporary feel of the apartments. They worked with Maryland Institute College of Art students to uh, repurpose and salvage materials into art, which is located in the lobby and in the office areas. Uh, the offices, like the apartments, have a very contemporary uh, loft-like feel. Uh, Teach for America is one of the anchor tenants in the building, along with other nonprofits. And the developers uh, sponsor a monthly uh, lunch and learn, a brown bag lunch series in the downtown, in the, sorry, the downstairs conference room, uh, which is a way that brings together tenants in the building and helps to connect them with other resources in the community uh, to help uh, enhance the, the service delivery that they're providing. Uh, the courtyard itself has become a, a real hub and gathering space for both residents and nonprofits, a number of which um, host events there. And uh, Charmington's Cafe is located on the corner. Uh, the community really wanted to see a locally grown business and coffee shop in the corner that could become a, a gathering space. And uh, Seawall Development Company found a, was able to partner with a local cooperative that operates the business. And they have, among other things, a practice of um, living wage, living fair wages. And President Obama uh, visited uh, Charmington's last February or la February last year as part of his tour to promote those practices. The uh, project was such a success that the, um, the teachers reached out to Seawall Development and encouraged them to purchase and renovate uh, houses, vacant houses in the neighborhood so that once they were ready to start families and invest in the neighborhood, they could actually stay in Remington. So Seawall uh, purchased 30 houses and uh, renovate them, renovated them and have sold them to former tenants of the building. And this is one uh, of them. They've also renovated a former, um, some other commercial structures surrounding the building, including a former tire shop, a traditional nonprofit office space, and a restaurant. Uh, they are developing a new building around the corner that will house a community health center in partnership with Johns Hopkins University, as well as additional housing units. Um, and this map gives you a sense of um, all the projects that they're working on right now. And uh, all in all, the project has really created a, um, a sense of community or brought the community together in a, in a way that links both longstanding residents and new ones. Uh, they've also um, redeveloped another former warehouse a couple miles away into a similar facility with housing uh, for teachers, a nonprofit office space. This is Union Mill, and have replicated it with another developer in Philadelphia. So this was really um, uh, the impact of the project, not only locally, but the fact that it is has prompted um, replication nationally was something that really um, resonated with our selection committee and uh, led them to select this project as the gold medalist. So shifting scales um, and also cities moving west to Cleveland, I'm going to talk about Uptown District, which is a, in many ways a different kind of approach. Um, 
to a project. This project is a very different scale, a over $200 million project involving 158 market rate apartments and 130 student beds. Um, the project goals um, really revolved around helping to reconnect um, a community and linking a number of cultural resources, universities, museums, and schools, as well as the adjoining communities, um, and, and to help, um, improve across the board, kind of improve not only the urban fabric, but the quality of life for residents. Uh, this project is located to the east of downtown Cleveland in the University District, which has been uh, long the hub for the major cultural institutions of Cleveland, but also a place that um, over the years has seen a, a good bit of dis disinvestment. In terms of partnerships, this is um, very much an anchor institution-led initiative, um, primarily with Case Western uh, Reserve University being a driver of development with the Cleveland Foundation being a major supporter, uh, particularly in terms of investing in the quality of design. Uh, this is the site before development, so you can get a sense of um, it, it really has been referred to as a no man's land that just provided a major disconnect between several important areas of the campus and cultural institutions. Um, and that was really a, a goal was to, to reconnect it and to also do it in a way that um, developed a signature architecture. So something that really helped to um, kind of move the needle on the dial of the dial in terms of design in the city of Cleveland, which um, generally has favored more um, conventional conservative architecture. Um, this map will give you a gives you a sense of the number of components of the development, which included housing, commercial space, and a new um, Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland. Uh, this project, um, like Miller's Court, is at the center of multiple, multiple neighborhoods, uh, many of which are some of the lowest income communities in the city of Cleveland. Uh, it's uh, one of the, a situation that's not unusual where there are big anchor institutions, where they're kind of right up against uh, some sort of uh, traditional neighborhood um, fabric. Uh, and a goal, a major goal of the project, as I mentioned earlier, was really to take a different approach towards architecture. Uh, uh, Natoma Architects, which is based in San Francisco, um, really sought to create a new architecture that was informed by historic architecture, sort of classic architecture of Paris, as well as uh, classic architecture of Cleveland, and to find a way to reinterpret it into a, um, a, a distinctly contemporary design using contemporary materials and um, a contemporary architecture. And this, uh, and to also introduce, but but on the one hand to be overtly contemporary, but to also um, create a fabric um, for the neighborhood. And this is another view of a, an early plan that lays out the different um, components of the project. Um, housing is on the upper levels. Commercial is primarily in the lower levels. The um, building on the uh, lower left-hand corner is the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland. Um, so this is a view um, looking along Euclid Avenue, one of the main streets that passes through it. Um, this is a view of the interior courtyard. So a number, um, in addition to the overall approach to the design, just the site planning itself really made an effort to create connections, mid-block connections, connections between street um, and um, also adjoining parking areas. This is the, the MOCA Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, this is a view from, from the street. Public plazas were another important piece. This is an example of one of the mid-block connections that connects through the, the um, structures of uptown into, in this case, parking behind. And this will give you a sense of that transition between the, the buildings of uptown and adjoining residential fabric. And the architecture also um, is intentionally um, laid out in a, such a way that it can be adaptable to certain, to different conditions. So in this case, we're looking at plans of the market rate housing, um, which are very rationally laid out with the, the um, bathrooms and kitchens lining the corridors um, with the living areas and bedroom areas facing to the outside. They are distinctly contemporary. This was an effort to really push the market to not um, offer a different kind of product that was not typically available in Cleveland, but also to push the market, um, the price of rental housing itself. Um, this is some of the common areas. And then those same unit types were adapted into student housing. In this case, these are, um, there are 130 beds for first year um, students at the local art college, um, each um, who share four bed apartments. 
And similarly, the common areas in the case of the student housing are now lounges. Uh, the project, in addition to the housing, includes a community grocery store, a locally owned grocery store, which is very important to the community, uh, the corner alley, which is a bowling alley, which has become a community gathering space. Uh, and as I mentioned, public spaces uh, were very important, including um, a terrace. This is Toby's Plaza, which includes um, public art, uh, transportation, transit connections. The, the bus rapid transit connecting downtown and University Circle runs through the heart of Uptown District. Um, and also the local regional transit authority, as well as the Cleveland Foundation, made investments in uh, the creation of a new rail connection at Little Italy, which is adjacent to Uptown District, as well as rebuilding an existing station. So making those connections um, to um, be between Uptown, Downtown Cleveland, and other areas was very important. So it really has effectively transformed what had been a no man's land into a, a new gateway for the area and community gathering space. This is an annual Blue Block Party hosted by Case Western Reserve University, um, and our, what really resonated with our uh, selection committee was the the power of collaboration among anchor institutions to to lead neighborhood change and and to really um, make an investment not only in placemaking but also quality design. So um, so those are two projects. I'm now going to turn this over to Garner to tell us a little bit about Quixote Village. I think you'll really have a, a terrific opportunity to hear directly from, from the architect um, about this remarkable project. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'll get my presentation up here. Let me know if we're up and live. You're good? Okay. I, we're good. Thank you, Tom. Well, thank you. Uh, as as Anne mentioned before in introductions and in you too, Tom, in my bio, uh, my name is Garner Miller and I'm the managing partner of MSGS Architects located in Olympia, Washington. We're, uh, we're a firm of seven, a smaller firm. We do regional work, primarily commercial and public. Um, interestingly enough, enough, my involvement in this project does not come out of a long background in homeless uh, housing, but comes uh, through community work that I was doing outside uh, to help the homeless community in Olympia, as well as that leading into some pro bono work to work with this particular uh, homeless community and try to um, sort of push permanent housing for this group in, this, in, uh, in, in Olympia. So the project goals for this, um, you can read over this list. Three I want to point out is that, first of all, one of the unique aspects of this particular homeless community is from the get-go, they were self-governed. Um, and they really care a lot about their particular group of people that they live with. And I think that has been a, a key component to the success of this project. The other is uh, low cost and reducing carbon footprint. Uh, as you can see, and as you probably uh, read, these, uh, th th this project is based on tiny houses, cottages, house these people in 144 square feet per unit. And that allowed us to do a lot with a little bit of money and also really reduce our, our impact on the environment and the planet as well. And uh, the third one I wanted to point out is Olympia, um, so you know, is not a huge city. Um, I think Thurston County in general is a little over 200,000, um, but what's outside of the rather small urban core is a lot of woods. And so if you're homeless in Olympia and you're not in the urban core, um, you are most likely probably camping outside of the woods, in the woods, in tents. And that is the context for a lot of these residents where they're coming in. And I'll speak more about that in a moment. The site context for this. So the project is located up in the top left-hand corner at the number one you can see on your screen. Um, this is about three miles southwest of downtown in what's primarily an industrial part of town. This site has a lot to do with NIMBY, not in my backyard. Uh, several sites were kicked around during the design process and um, the one that really stepped up had to do with two things. One, because it wasn't a lot of residential neighbors uh, in this location, and two, because 
this ended up being essentially free land that Thurston County, the county government owned, that they had purchased. Uh, it actually sits on a former gravel parking lot of a Tyson's seafood processing plant, which is the building we see immediately to the left that the county now uses for a warehouse. So leasing this land for a dollar a year uh, was a big component to making this project actually work. So I will um, be talking a bit about design uh, on this, this uh, presentation here, but also kind of beyond design in the sense that I think a lot of what we do as architects um, is sometimes we, we, we really need to focus on the programming of buildings, most of you know that. Um, and really get to what our clients need, and, and that really makes projects successful. But also, um, you know, sometimes we think of codes as rules, and sometimes you have to think outside that box or even reshape the box. And there were a lot of things against this project in terms of local city zoning and planning rules and building codes, fire sprinkler codes, things like that that this project doesn't conform in, into. And so uh, a lot of thought was given and a lot of work was given outside of traditional architecture in order to make this model actually work uh, as, as a physical building. And then funding sources as well. Um, a bit about cost. So you'll see in a second that the residents, this particular community, had been living in tents for quite a while. And our local advocacy group here in Olympia really wanted to put them into a permanent shelter. However, the average cost in America provi for providing permanent housing is about $250,000 a unit. Compare that with the cost of a tent. That is, is night and day apples and oranges. And our thought was there's got to be a middle ground that we can find to try to get more housing units built for homeless. Um, in the end, the cost of a Coyote unit is about, or it turned out to be about $102,000 per unit. This is here a breakdown of funding sources um, that you can see. Comes, money came from a lot of different uh, avenues. Some federal money through housing and urban development that was funneled through states and county sources, um, in-kind services, local donations, quite a mix. But with each of these uh, Funding sources often come strings attached, rules that we need to abide by as well. And again, the idea of housing homeless in, in cottages is not necessarily fitting all those rules. But to truly understand this project, I want to take you back to the beginning of this particular community. So um, back in 2007, just as the recession was hitting, there was a group of individuals who set up camp in a city-owned parking lot that was leased uh, for people to park in that worked downtown. You can see a picture of it here. This was not something that the city was interested in maintaining or keeping, and quite a standing community and the city government uh, ensued for several weeks. And it got to the point where something had to give, and a local church, the uh, United the United uh, Universalist Church here in Olympia, which is located about, oh, I don't know, two miles west of downtown here, stepped up to take these people onto their property. They had land that they could camp on. And so that ended that immediate stalemate. But still, camps on, city, on church uh, property were not allowed in the city. So the city did step up and pass an ordinance to allow these camps to exist. However, they had to move 90, in 90 days. And so over the next seven years, a network was set up of local churches between five and six that would take these camps for uh, these 90-day periods, then later was extended to 120-day periods uh, to house. But then at the end of that period, they needed to move to the, uh, the next location. And you can see winter, summer, didn't matter. These, uh, this camp was moving all over town. So what was it like uh, in Camp Coyote? They did have, uh, in addition to the tents that almost uh, the, the, the residents actually owned and were sleeping in, they did have a community tent. This is a picture of the inside of this. You can see the kitchen in the back with the microwave 
and a refrigerator, propane, a big propane tank here to cook uh, on the gas stove. One of the stipulations for the churches that hosted these camps was that they had to have a church person, someone representing the host, to be on site 24 hours a day. And so my church happened to be one of those. And we would sign up for three-hour shifts 24-7 uh, there uh, on, on camp in the camp, usually in the host tent. And this was really eye-opening for many of us to be able to actually spend time with this uh, group of people and really understand who they were and what their needs are. And I think between that uh, and community outreach that was done through a group called PAMSA, which was a community support group made up of a lot of people in the community uh, for this group, the seed was born to try to create a permanent solution for the camp. This is what a typical moving day looks like. This happens to be my church here. Um, but we would get anywhere from 40 to 50 community volunteers to come out and help pack up the camp every 90 or 120 days, load everything on the trucks and move it to the next site and set it up. So it was quite an effort. I want to talk a bit about the residents themselves. So the residents comprise of about anywhere from 25 to 30, maybe 32 people at the most. And it completely, ever since they were in that parking lot, they were completely self-governing. They have council meetings every Sunday night, and uh, they, uh, they, they take applications for new residents. They vote them in. They have very specific rules about what you can and can't do in camp. They are... Uh, intended to be drug and alcohol free within the camp. If you break the rules, this particular group votes out. And that system has worked really well. And I think one of the, one of the strengths of what they have done that really is translated into this tight-knit community of a bunch of cottages with a central community building, that they, uh, it, it, it just really fits their model. And until we got in and really talked with them and met with them and understood uh, what their needs were. I don't think we really grasped on how powerful that was as a solution. So about this time when there was, uh, this was maybe 2010 or so, uh, there was a group of individuals led by the EcoBuild, which is a local group involved in promoting sustainability in Olympia in some collaboration with the Evergreen State College's design program, hosted a design competition for cottages, either mobile or permanent, uh, because there had been talk about this being a low-cost solution for housing. And this really sort of sparked a lot of ideas about getting permanent solution for uh, housing, specifically for Kyoto Village here in town. And I'm just briefly going to run through some of these pictures here, some of the entries that that uh, came out of that competition here. There was no prize. Eventually, none of this was built quite as uh, shown here. But nonetheless, this really started to spark that interest in, in creating something permanent. So this next, I mentioned the site in, in the map uh, above. And signing the site leased to Ponza, who is the organization that actually owns and manages the village, the support group, finding the site leased to Ponza for a dollar a year was probably one of the most important things that could have happened to make this project successful. I mentioned the seafood packing plant that is the neighbor to the west, which you can see over the top of the village is there in the picture on the right. The other side is a heavy equipment uh, rental company, a company that rents bulldozers dump trucks and things like that. Um, despite this being in an area where you would think there's not a lot of people and not a lot of uh, potential um, conflict, nonetheless, there was still a huge legal challenge over having this site located with homeless uh, people on it. And in fact, it's a, it's a battle that dragged out for several months. Um, but in the end, the camp prevailed which was uh, very good news, and we moved forward. So at this work, uh, at this at, the, at this point, um, I had assembled a pro bono team of myself, a civil engineer, and another architect to assist in doing programming. And one of the things I think that is really key to understand here is that in any project, 
involving your clients in programming and really understanding their needs is key. And I know for some people this may be uncomfortable in dealing with homeless, uh, the homeless population. But nonetheless, I think that was incredibly important and, and key to the success of this project. So we led a series of workshops that uh, involved getting the residents engaged in designing what would ultimately become their village. This was a site planning exercise workshop that we did here where we divided the, uh, the, the residents that showed up, and I think I want to say maybe half showed up, 15 or so, into groups. We did three groups and took the site and essentially laid out how they saw their community best working. And first of all, I want to emphasize that the tiny cottages idea was absolutely key for uh, all of them because I mentioned the history of them coming out of the woods. Um, they were used to living on their own. They, this is a population that, that flat out told us they would not be comfortable in a typical housing apartment building. Um, they needed that autonomy. But at the same time, because of their community, they really liked the idea of having a lot of their amenities in a central community building, but not necessarily sleeping there. So this group, uh, this group worked laying out sites, and the first group came up with a plan that essentially um, is more or less like a city, city kind of layout with, with cottages um, kind of spread out, a central kind of main street path going down the middle that you can see there and then kind of branching off to a couple uh, accessible units. We did include accessible units in this project as well, um, anticipating some members' wheelchairs. Um, as you can see some of the other amenities, the bright green uh, square there is a community building. We were reusing the existing parking lot on the bottom of the screen there. Um, that envelope that says rec on it was an addition that this group thought we'd need a recreation area. It was something that was really strong to them. Our community garden up at the top of the screen was a really important program to develop, uh, element that they came up with, as well as a tool shed and a workshop um, as, as these members are anticipating, we're anticipating doing all the maintenance and keeping this village operational. The second group laid out uh, their community a little different. Centralized around the community building, but in five kind of distinct pods or clusters of, of cottages, where they would sort of develop smaller communities within the larger community. And in this group, Somewhat in between, this is almost like a circle um, in the sense it was broken up a little bit with four smaller communities. Um, but you can see, you know, that all of this kind of central, centralized around a, an open common outdoor space. So each group presented these options and got a chance to talk about the highs and the lows, what, what worked and what didn't work. And in the end, the, the upper solution here was the one that sort of rose to the top more or less and with the idea that all of them really liked the idea of being located around a central outdoor space that was their commons and to be able to see each other even though they weren't living in the same um, apartment block per se to just to be able to see each other so some of the challenges that I mentioned um, with regard to getting these built um, first of all the HUD requirements for housing are such that each each housing unit, if you're getting funded with that money, needs to have a restroom facility. And um, in the beginning, we were thinking that was an expense that was above and beyond where we saw, at least, the goals of the project. However, after discussing with the residents, they really um, <laughs> did not see it that way. So you can see in this original one, we had a restroom up at the top, of the page associated with the workshop and down below in the community building itself. Um, but the residents kind of agreed that that was a compromise that all, we all kind of needed to make and even though it cost more money made a lot of sense. So here you can see an early three-dimensional uh, model what, what this layout around the central space uh, in the middle would look like with the community building and a front and center off the parking lot design of, of cottages, the early design of the cottages here. Um, we opted to delve a little bit into the idea of prefab with cottages. 
the um, there are several companies in our area, probably in most areas of the country, that make prefab sheds and even a little above and beyond sheds into small cabins that you can buy as kits. And we really thought that would be an economic way to uh, to build these cabins. And so this was a publicly bid project. And when it went out, we gave the contractors the option. You could go with a prefab or you could use the design, essentially, of the prefab to construct your own stick-built cottage. In the end, the stick-built actually won out, which was ultimately what was built. Um, but it was a really interesting exercise to to try to see how prefab could come into play in uh, the development of tiny cottages for homeowners. The community building. This, whoops, slide too many. I got about two minutes, so I'll wrap this up. The community building here, um, as you can see, houses everything that's essential to the residents. That is not their sleeping quarters and their private bathrooms. So showers are located up in the upper right-hand corner. The main living room and the kitchen. It's really a dual kitchen. They do all their own uh, cooking and have have uh, meal sign-ups and all that. There's a conference room down by the entry at the lower left-hand corner, which they use for um, support groups as well as their TV room in the building. And there is an on-site staff person that is located in the office as well. And then laundry facilities uh, and mail facilities as well. The community uh, building here. Again, coming out of the woods, we wanted everybody wanted to create a sense of sort of a, a lodge, northwest kind of feel to it. So use of cedar, uses of overhangs, porches is essential for those groups. They really, even though they like to be inside, they also like to be outside and hang out in a dry location. And so porches and overhangs are key design-wise. Um, sustainability. Um, though I don't believe yet the funding's been um, been raised for solar, but we designed the building to be both solar power and solar water ready construction here. So here's, I'm just going to finish up real quick with some shots of the interior of the building. This is the kitchen and a living room space in the community building. Showers. There's a Blackboard community message board. This is where everyone in the residence in the living room actually uh, communicates. Pictures of cottages. Again, the porch and that importance. And that concludes this uh, presentation on my part here. All right, thank you very much, Garner. That was uh, very interesting to see that whole process. Um, I was wondering, do you know what the, um, the surrounding community, how they have received this project? Uh, this was, uh, when was it built? Yeah, uh, the village opened on Christmas Eve 2013 and uh, did okay. it just in time uh, for the Christmas move there. Um, and actually, overall, the community has been extremely supportive after it's been open. You know, there there were certain individuals that fought tooth and nail against this project, but I think I think it would be safe to say that for the most part they've been won over as well. But there's been a huge overwhelming support for the village from all aspects of the community, from you know government leaders down to uh, people you know dropping off donations on a regular basis at the community building. I would just add this is Anne Marie that um, one of the the, the kind of comments that we heard multiple times during our interview process for Quixote Village was really how the project and the experience of um, the volunteers in the community like Garner um, getting to know people in, at Camp Quixote really changed the people's perceptions about homelessness um, in the community. And in fact, we were, you know, as part of the the zoning or the, the guidelines from the city, um, they required at each time the camp moved that there be a community meeting to kind of, you know, have share information, address any concerns. And from what we heard, apparently, you know, the early meetings, there were a lot of people would show up because of concerns. And then it, um, as people became more familiar with Camp Quixote, 
uh, people understood that, in fact, you know, the, the residents of Camp Quixote were really important, valued partners in the community, and it was actually sort of a value added to have the camp there so that those meetings, you know, fewer people showed up to those meetings because there wasn't as much concern. So it really, again, from our selection committee's perspective, I mean, you know, one of the really important ideas was the degree to which this this change that this project helped to change perceptions in the community. Yes, absolutely. Do you think um, has there been any talks of replicating this um, in in Olympia or any other cities nearby? Um, as far as Olympia goes, there is talk of um, possibly creating a second village. There's uh, nothing solid at this point, but the need is still here, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's only 30 units here, only room for 30 residents. But there is usually a waiting list, and uh, you know, this is what is termed as permanent supportive housing, and essentially what that means is if you want to stay here, you can stay here. Uh, there's no there's no time limit on how long you can be here, and this is a great place for people to. Um, to, to launch off and um, you know for that reason it's a little unpredictable about how many people uh, will be kind of coming and going at any time it changes quite a bit um, as far as other communities I get calls uh, fairly regularly from communities all over the country that are thinking about projects like this and see it as an example and I think a lot of it for them is the idea of a lower cost solution to housing, which I think is great. I do want to emphasize though that I think, again, I think the success of this particular project has so much to do with community within this group. And um, I, I, I do emphasize that, that I think, um, you know, you, you can design for community, but you really have to have the buy-in of the people that are living in there to make that community keep happening. So to my knowledge, I don't know of any other um, communities that are the road of actually implementing this model in another location. I've been really watching out, but if anyone else has, um, chime in because I'm actually curious myself. Yeah, we did hear, again, during our site interviews, we um, had been told that uh, there's a project, the founders of Occupy Madison's t Tiny Home Development consider Quixote Village as an inspiration. Um, and that was some, it sounds like there were some conversations happening about adapting the model in Eugene, Oregon, and Austin, Texas, um, as well as some mm -hmm. other cities in western Washington. But I think, again, just, um, you know, another comment from our selection committee that um, was really important to their selecting Quixote Village as a silver medalist was the idea that this is, provides sort of another way, uh, another kind of prototype or way of looking at uh, housing for the homeless that, you know, I think often our model is, you know, giving, you know, providing a, a room in a, you know, a multi-unit facility and the idea of adapting the tiny, ha tiny house model um, was very uh, captivating and I, I've had some conversations with folks working with uh, more traditionally rural populations um, such as Native American communities where they're, they're really seeing value in this model. And, and a model that has a lot of potential for, for helping their communities. Yes. I will say to the architects out here too, um, I mean the tiny house model, I, you know, I obviously lived it and I believe in it. There are challenges to that, um, not you know, just from a technical standpoint as well. I didn't get a chance to delve into this too much in the presentation, but for instance, zoning wise, um, there's nothing in our that was in our current zoning code that would allow a community like this. And I think that is true for most communities. And so one of the things architects have to do sometimes is sort of try to bend the rules or change the rules um, that we they usually design by. And so I worked pretty closely with the City of Olympia's uh, planning and community development team and ultimately city council to craft an ordinance for zoning that would actually allow this to happen. Some of the other technical challenges is how do you classify something like this in the building code? It's not an apartment building. It's sort of like a dormitory, except there's separate buildings involved here. They're certainly not 
single occupancy residences. So we're very close with the building department to come up with something that we could call this with a straight face that um, kind of passed muster from a code standpoint and and fire sprinklers as well. Ultimately, this was classified as a residential uh, unit, much like a dormitory um, would be, which under the building code requires to be fire sprinklered, and that's a very expensive proposition and something that we worked very close with the fire department to ultimately ended up actually running the fire sprinkler lines off of the domestic water source so we didn't have to bring in a completely separate fire line service to service all these cottages which saved um, a lot of money but again that was that was a, a real kind of fight um, that you know we had to be very proactive in, to, in order to make this work so uh, there, there are lots of hurdles um, to get over to try to do this tiny cottage uh, solution but at least there's precedent now which is great <laughs> Mm -hmm. Anything um, leads into my next question for Anne Marie. Um, does the Bruner Foundation ever play any role as a, an advisor to local housing authorities? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, to my knowledge, we have not. Um, certainly, we do. Uh, one of the goals of the award was to share these stories. So we do field inquiries from folks from time to time. Um, for instance, um, I fielded some calls from people working in other cities that are uh, interested in developing projects to address homelessness in their city. So I will uh, direct them to some of our winners, the case studies about some of our winners that, that do. Um, and we also um, like to think of the people we meet and involve in the award, um, such as selection committee members, as well as the architects and developers and public officials and others that we interview during our site visits as, um, as potential resources. And we will often refer people we meet who are interested in projects or, or addressing certain issues to folks in our network. I like the idea of uh, you always, I believe you said you always have a mayor on the panel. Um, how do you recruit the government officials? Sure. We um, Well, we always have a mayor because we believe that in many ways they, more than anyone, kind of understand the complexity of making these projects happen and, and the careful, complex negotiations that, that go on. So um, it varies. Um, we in touch with people we know, um, such as the folks that work for, on the Mayor's Institute on City Design, uh, who are working with mayors across the country. Uh, sometimes we get to meet mayors. We generally meet mayors um, in the cities um, during, during our site interviews, so we will keep folks we meet during those visits um, on, uh, in mind when we go to put together a selection committee. So, um, and if I'm always happy to take suggestions if people know, um, we um, are always looking for mayors who um, have an interest in design in the built environment, but we're also one of our goals is to really help influence the quality of design in cities by involving mayors in the selection process, which gives them a, a really remarkable view of what's happening across America in urban development. That's really great, and it was great to hear Garner trying to take on a role of uh, helping his local city deal with some of the issues that he sees um, could be fixed, face homelessness. Um, so we are out of time, but um, we'd like to thank Anne-Marie and Garner very much for um, sharing these projects with us. and. I'd like to remind everyone that you should be receiving an email with a survey by the end of the day. Um, please be sure to fill that out so you can receive continuing education credits. Um, again, thank you very much, Anne-Marie, Connor. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.